how's it going with Mitch? It's going great. Um, you know, we're starting to write songs now. And the great thing about it was, um, since he lives in Florida now, he moved from Nashville to Florida. So, you know, it's not like I can just go, hey, come on over and l let's work on songs. So I went in the studio, just a friend of mine's little studio down the street and uh, I wrote a couple songs. I sent him a song. Normally when I work with singers, I'm like in the room with them and I might give them some melody ideas or uh, just let them know what I'm hearing kind of thing. But I just sent him music and he came back with a full song and we, were, me and Michael were like blown away. I couldn't believe it. I go, man, this is great to break the ice this way because it'll be less work for me and unless i hear something that i don't agree with you know I'll, I'll pretty much go with it you know normally i have ideas about melodies in my head and you know but i wanted to give him a chance to, to give him music and see what he comes with so that that's working out real good you know we're just kind of putting riffs together we're going to rehearse tonight and kind of go over a few things and uh we're kind of taking our time just trying to come up with the best stuff we can but we definitely want to try to get something this year with Mitch on it. Why did he move to Florida from Nashville? Um, I, I guess, you know, he'd been in Nashville for a while, and him and his wife just decided they uh, wanted to move to Florida for whatever reason. Like she might have family there. And I you're still based out of Los Angeles? Yeah, I'm actually uh, near uh, a city called... Uh, have you heard of Riverside or Redlands? Sure. Yeah, I live uh, near uh, Redlands, California, but it's like up in the kind of up in the hills, like not way in the mountains, but like about 3,500 feet up. And it's a lot cooler. That's why I got out of Palm Desert. It was just so brutal in the, in the summer. Did you have you know, any of the... Like, um any of the recent fires over there were they near you or no that's that's more in the valley near los angeles on the other side of los angeles that's about 100 miles from me yeah obviously i saw it on the news and you know all the devastation well, yeah i'm in colorado springs so we had those um you know whatever that's been now seven years ago or i had a really good friend a uh, really good friend of mine that lived in colorado springs i'm not sure if he's still there but he used to be a referee on the on the pro billiards tour. Scott Smith. He had a place called Rack and Roll, Colorado Springs. On one side they had bands playing, and on the other side they had pool table. And I saw that you're quite the um, pool shark. Yeah, it's just kind of a hobby of mine that you know I play. Been playing like forever. You sure. Know? So I play probably better than your average guitar player. So as far as um, with an album, is it just kind of too early to think of putting together a new record with Mitch, or is that kind no. of just the working no, goal? No, no, that's what, that's what we're kind of doing now. We're just uh, writing songs. Um, you know, Michael and I have been coming up with a lot of things, kind of sending it back and forth, ideas and stuff. And uh, today we're going to get into a room together because that's when, you know, the best stuff happens is when we're all playing together. We know about, like in an actual recording, we would never sent each other our parts before. It's just, you know, like that's really kind of a first probably that I sent Mitch like music. Um, normally we, you know, we get together. When we do it for real, we always get together. But, you know, we do idea, you know, the ideas on our own like the last record we only got together for 10 days before we went to michael wagner's in nashville and um but we were kind of we all had a lot of ideas so the first four days we were in this kitchen area just like showing each other ideas really didn't get a lot done just kind of picked the stuff we wanted to work on and then went in at hardcore for like six days but we went up there with no lyrics finished we just had like ideas for choruses and stuff. It was pretty funny. Michael Wagner definitely was not used to that. <laughs> and so did, did did Terry write the lyrics for that, or just kind of everybody pitch in? We all did. And lucky for us, uh, he records one song at a time. Not not the basic tracks. The basic tracks we finish, and then like we you know redo the guitars and everything, and we'll just have like a scatting thing going on. But we knew in advance, once we were going to start doing the overdubs, we knew in advance the night before what song we were doing the next day. So we all just kind of crammed together. We were living in this house in Nashville. We all just got together and just, you know, came up with the lyrics and they would go in with the lyric sheet each day to give to Wagner. The house is at Michael Wagner's? You're staying kind of all in the studio in a house or is it a... No, no, we rented a house. Oh, we I got gotcha. you. Like a, 
uh, Airbnb kind of thing. That, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Really nice on a lake. It was be- it was really killer. Oh, very nice. Uh, really great vibe. Real quiet. No distractions whatsoever. You know, it's just awesome. Yeah, I think when I. I interviewed Wolf Hoffman long ago. He had a farm at the time with, uh, and then had a studio on the property. Uh, and Michael either lived at the studio or ha- it was Michael's studio. But I don't think that's anymore, right? I mean, Wolf Hoffman, I think, moved, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Wolf moved, but uh, Michael loved Nashville so much that he bought a house there on about five acres and built a studio on his property. A state-of-the-art, the the most killer studio you can imagine. I'm kind of obsessed with the um, self-titled and the Out of the Night, those early days. And um, my very first concert was um, you guys opening up for Judas Priest. I was like 12 years old. I mean, to me as a kid, I thought you guys were better than Judas Priest. And I don't know if that was because it just you guys related more to me or or something. But I just love the whole uh, white BC Rich, your whole thing with the... Uh headband that whole vibe in that record i felt the um self-titled really captured the essence of los angeles or something i I don't know i've just always uh loved that uh, record and i still love that record i I, still like it actually my and my kids all love it you know they uh you know i could still listen back to that and it and it's uh you know it still holds up it was uh it was pretty amazing that we actually, when we first met Alan Niven and we were going to make the EP and we flew, we flew out Michael Wagner from Germany and uh, he didn't really know very much English, um, but it was a real early part of his career and it was real exciting. We did that EP and we didn't even have really a record deal at that time, just a distribution. And somehow through some kind of magic, I don't to this day, I'm not really, exactly sure but we got a song in heavy rotation on the biggest station in los angeles with no record deal and that's how you know the excitement was created but it really wasn't i mean i'd never heard of it before and i've lived in la my whole life but i'd never heard of a band that's not signed be in rotation with like you know the tom petty's and (laughs) whatever you know so that was pretty amazing, total magic. And uh, first tour was with Whitesnake, actually, in Europe. So the the thing you saw with Priest, that was our, our second run, you know. And I'm really glad because it, it gave us a little bit of seasoning playing arenas and stuff because, you know, we were coming out of, like, clubs and backyards, basically. So it was pretty pretty amazing experience. One memory I have is uh, playing Glenn Tipton and Poole for like 10 hours. And it was on a show date. Like we had a show the next day. We played till about seven in the morning. And, you know, and we went, you know, and then we, we go, we got to go sleep, man. But we were so into it. It's funny. We just lost track of time and uh, went and took naps. And I remember after I got off, I got off stage and I, I wanted to see what condition he was in and the whole band was walking by me and glenn looked at me and he goes i don't feel well <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome and they did a great show they did a great show sure but, you know that's kind of a standout and also just in general you know they they kind of took us under their wing a little bit you know kind of just, you know, they they had more experience. They'd been on tours and stuff, and, and we didn't know what the hell was going on. And, you know, we were kind of green. And I don't know. They, you know, it was just, uh, they were just really good people. And the crowds, I'm assuming the crowd was loved you guys, I know, in Dallas. like that every night. It was completely, insanely amazing. It was a different band then. I mean, as far as, you know, we were just a trio. It's just bass, guitar, and drums. The music was a little different, and it was a very early part of our writing, so we were actually, Jesus Priest and the Scorpions were both kind of bands that were flying under the radar when we were first write, kind of writing songs a couple of years before, you know, we broke out and went on tour with them. I mean, we were going to work in the morning listening to Priest, but they weren't really a commercial band at the time, so 
not a lot of people knew about them, only the, you know, the hip rock as Well, they packed so, stadiums. They were one of those bands that would pack arenas, but, um, but yeah, didn't sell millions of records. They, they didn't have the commercial. I mean, you know, they had rock and roll or whatever, and it really didn't get tons of airplay. But anyways, uh, the point being is when we were starting to write songs, we were trying to be like the Scorpions and Judas Priest. You know, we wanted to, you know, kind of be heavy, and, and in a way it was forced but I think we did good you know I interviewed Jack uh, a long time ago as well and I'm not sure at that point it seems like he's done some things since then and kind of did a little um, gig where Gary Holland came up and and then I think even sung some of the old school songs but when I brought it up he was like uh-huh. like uh, kind of dismissed that record I'd ask him about certain songs like does he include Street Killer or Stick It and uh, I think he might now but um, I'm glad I to hear so. I don't think so because those songs are so high and everything we you know break out on your knees every once in a while and we played a couple but um yeah, I, I'm really super proud of the record. I mean, you know, but everybody has their own opinion. But um, I, I can still listen to it. And I have a little grandson who's like f- uh, six years old now, and he loves it. He goes around. I have him on video, like singing Stick It, and just going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like amazing, you know. Where did you guys record that out of the night EP? Um, in, in Redondo Beach. Um uh, it was a studio called Total Access, owned by a fellow called Wynn Davis, who's an engineer in his oh, own sure. right. Done a lot of things. Really, really good engineer. That name is on Shot in the Dark, isn't it? In Wynn yeah. Davis? Yeah. Uh, he engineered that, I believe. And um, he also has done, worked with Dawkin. I believe he did a couple solo albums of Dawkin. And he's done a, a ton of things, you know, EO and all sorts of stuff. Oh, okay. And did he engineer Out of the Night or did Michael engineer? that no michael wagner uh, did the whole thing he, uh him and him and Dawkins, he he engineered it and Dawkins kind of produced the ep and uh then this the first full-length album again we had michael wagner i always um kind of trip out on the whole don Dawkins thing because at this point don Dawkins isn't anybody and i had recently interviewed uh pete holmes from black and blue and they had a big uh, docking connection as well, um, pre-contract, you know, uh, before their record contract. And I, I mean, he hadn't really done anything yet. So how does this connection right. come with Don well, Dockin? I met him in 1975 in another band. And he was in a band called Airborne, so we were friends from way back then. When he got Lynch and started to get his band going, uh, Alan Niven... Uh, did him a really big favor, uh, and Alan was uh, from England, and he worked for Virgin Records for five years. So when he came out here and started working for an independent label called Enigma, who signed Motley Crue, Berlin, and they would sign bands and then sell them off to big labels. And uh, Dokken, I guess, was looking for management, and Niven introduced uh, Don to Peter Minch and Cliff Bernstein, and they became who were Def Leppard's guys, and and they became Dawkins' managers. So when Niven was, you know, they signed Berlin, and Niven was looking for a rock band, and asked Don, you know, you know, who's one of the better bands around? I, I'm really interested in getting a you know rock band on this label, Enigma, and. And he said, Dante Fox is what we were called at the time. Sure. <laughs> so I guess Alan, and I didn't know this until way later, he came and saw us and didn't like it. And he goes, okay, maybe I missed something. I'm going to go again. So he went and saw us again. It still wasn't hearing it. So he told Don, he goes, I don't know about these guys. You know, I've seen them twice. And, you know, <laughs> I just, I'm just not seeing it. He goes, dude, you're missing it. You're missing it. He goes, I'm going to go with you, because we were playing the whiskey in Hollywood. And so Don went with them, and they went down to see us. And on the encore, and this is, I, I didn't find this out for quite a while, you got to realize, but on the encore, we played No Doctor by Humble Pie. And that sold Niven, you know, like I see the possibilities here, <laughs> you know? So who knows, man? You know, it's like 
Every band has a story, right? You know, and it's is this... not always the perfect scenario with the demo tape and the eight by ten. You know, right? Is so, is this still when like Don Costa and Tony Richards are in the band? Um, at the time, it was uh, a guy called Morn Black Costa. I actually got him a gig in Ozzy through George Lynch. George Lynch called me one day and said he was in Dallas and he was auditioning for Ozzy and they need a bass player. He goes, that bass player you guys had would be perfect. And I, I called Costa. He went He went there. He'd already quit our band like about three weeks prior. And uh, so literally this guy had only done two shows with us that was in the band when Niven came and saw us at the Whiskey. And, Lauren uh, Black? Yeah, Lauren Black. Yeah, of course and, I know. And, and, and Tony Richards had been in the band. The original band was Don Costa, uh, Tony Richards, and a guy named Butch Say was the lead singer. And then we had a chick singer, and then Jack Russell. And Jack so we had was... Two, singer, two singers before Jack in, in Dante Fox. But uh, Tony Richards was replaced with uh, Gary Holland. Right. So that was the band when uh, Nib and Sauce was Gary. Okay. Horn, Jack so it was and I. it was it was the band that that made it. Wow. I think I'm still the only one that's ever interviewed um, Tony Richards. Oh ever. really? We have, me, him, and Don all lived together in a house. We bought it. My mom was a real estate agent. She made it to where we didn't have to do a down payment. <laughs> we didn't last long, but uh, yeah, Tony was a great guy. Really, uh, he's kind of a natural drummer. The funny thing is, and I've never played anybody with anybody quite like him. He's a really excellent drummer. He feels the music. But he can't play it the same way two times in a row. <laughs> but it, it might be, the, it, it's going to be good twice in a row. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. It's always going to be good. But if you're looking for him to repeat, like, you know, drum fills and stuff like that, he's really not that type of drummer. He's, he, he was more of a, you know, an awesome Just feeling it skills, out. Yeah. Awesome skills, but not, not a guy who gets his parts all together and right. does it this I liked his drumming, and I loved that first Wasp record. And um, right. I thought um, I thought his drumming kind of uh, was appropriate for that first Great White right. record. Great drummer, great drummer. And I was really happy to see him get right in Wasp. You know, I didn't want to see him, you know, just go off and not do anything. So that that shows you he, he had skills. You know, he went out there and he got a gig. And and so to part with him, the reasoning behind it was just that he didn't really do the same uh, thing twice? Well, um, here's the deal. We all partied, we all partied down, you know, we're young, young guys. Sure. You know, but he, he was kind of getting drunk at the gigs, like before we played. It, it was getting like a little out of hand. And Gary Holland was like following us around going, I'll blow that guy away, I'll blow that guy away. So... Costa goes, we should get this guy. He kind of sort of talked me into it. But I uh, I can tell you, uh, you know, scale level wise, uh, Tony was definitely had the upper hand. Uh, Gary was a great guy, though. Those initial out of the night sessions, were they done just multiple sessions or were they done? Yeah. We're, what happened was uh, Don and Alan and Michael Wagner came to where we practiced in a garage and uh, we did all the pre-production there and then went in and did a five song EP and then Alan within a couple weeks or whatever he had on your knees in rotation on the radio like I said and that created uh, I guess some excitement and a buzz around town with the major labels. Then we found ourselves in a situation where we were going to all these major labels, kind of doing the bidding, you know, uh, listening to these guys offer this and that and the other. And we ended up going with a label called uh, EMI. EMI America. Sure. Who only at the time had Queen's Reich. And the thinking was, oh, we're going to get a lot of attention because they don't have like tons and tons of bands. So we won't get lost in the shuffle. That that was the thinking why we went to that label. Um, so we go on the White Tank tour. We go on the Judas Priest tour. We come home and we don't sell enough records to make them very happy. So they didn't even want to do a second record, even though we had a contract for six albums. They didn't even want to do a second album because we'd only sold 100,000 to where normal labels at that time did the artist development thing 
You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, they sold a hundred thousand. Let's try to get them to two fifty. Maybe get a songwriter in here and have write them a, a big song or have them work with songwriter. You know what I mean? Sure. That's just an example of the th- kind of things that normally. That happen. was the exact question so, I asked Jack. Was why at a time like that when you have development deals, why why did they abandon you after yeah, one? Yeah, it, it kind of blew us away. You know, uh, we could have done another record contractually. But they would have just shelved it. They even told us that. We'll just put it on the shelf. We won't put a dollar into it. So we said, what's the point? So we just, uh, we bailed out, you know, we, uh, you know, took it on the chin, you know, t- took our lumps and and went, borrowed some money, went in and we recorded Shot in the Dark, that second album with no deal, borrowed the money from some guy named Fred and <laughs> We got another hit on the radio. It was like number two song of the year on KLOS called Face a Day. Sure. And that generated interest in Capitol Records. Which was, uh, um, EMI was an offshoot of Capitol, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Uh, Capital was the father company. That's what was so ironic. Yeah. Uh, of all labels, that one, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, we never really... You know, we we always had to make some kind of demo before we were able to do a record before, you know. So I guess Shot in the Dark was kind of that demo. Although we we did have that semi hit with uh, Face a Day, like in Texas, I believe they played it, and Arizona, also LA. So, you know, we we're kind of the independent band, but we did have that pedigree of that tour with Judas Priest and it wasn't like we were totally unknown. So Ray Tuscan, a and R guy for Capital, came down and saw us at a club called the Coach House and signed us that night. So next thing we know, here we go again. You know, okay, it's do or die this time. And you're getting a second chance. You know what I mean? Right. And that's when we came with Rock Me and, and Lady Red Light and that album. Of course. Once bitten. Of course. So, yeah. well, we even made T-shirts that year in 1985, but we had no record. Survive 85 T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know what I mean? It was like, God, please help us. You know, <laughs> we need another. We need another chance. I remember seeing Rob Alford in Hollywood, and I'm going, dude, man. God, we've got a whole year with no record deal, man. We, we really need to get there. And he's like, well, good luck, you know. Not too long after that, we did get a deal, and I, man, I was thrilled. And our first tour, when we made that record, was with uh, Night Ranger, and that was really cool. And then we just went from band to band, Twisted Sister, and then White Snake, <laughs> you know, Tesla. It seemed like it never ended, you know. We'd end one tour, go to another one. Yeah, I think I saw yeah. you on the, the White Snake tour as well, because that was White Snake's huge record, wasn't it? At the same time, oh, yeah. as once I been. think they yeah. sold ten million. Yeah, I, I know it was eight million way back then. Probably at ten now at least. Yeah, when I was looking up record sales, I'm like, there's just no way that Once Bitten hasn't gone. I mean, it was certified platinum pretty quickly after oh, yeah. its release. It's double platinum easily now. Right. And uh, the other one sold two and a half million about a year and a half ago. Had uh, greatest hits go gold. We probably sold. A, Close to 11 million worldwide, but, which isn't great. You know, our peers have sold more and stuff, oh, and some still, less, but, yeah. you know, whatever. A lot of people have sold <laughs> a lot less, yeah. They just don't count the records anymore? Or? Yeah, they count them. Actually, they count them better than they used to. And Airplay also, because of the, you know, before it used to be like you'd go to, a, like, wherever, a bowling alley or pool hall, and it just had jukeboxes that had the little counters. <laughs> it's... It's really hard to rely on that for, you know, that type of uh, airplay, or, you know, spins, if you will, that sure. you used to call them. Everything's piped, piped into the internet, so, so it's easy for all our plays to get counted. What gets played the most nowadays? God, I've seen this sheet. It's pretty amazing uh, and rather obscure. I, I sometimes rock me, of course, usually gets the most airplay, but some of the other songs like Call It Rock and Roll, Always has a lot of play, Mr. Bone, and there's stuff like we'll get something in a movie or something. I remember I was watching this movie and all of a sudden Stick It came on out of nowhere. I was watching another movie and Lady Red Light came out of nowhere. We usually, we get simp piece for that and, you know, 
royalties and stuff. So it's always good to have the music out there. We haven't had a commercial with our... Niven was always against that too. We, we could have been in McDonald's commercials. We could have done all that stuff. But uh, he kept us away from that. He, yeah. he didn't want us to be the, that kind of band. Well, nowadays it's not a big deal and hasn't been for a long time. But right. Kind of back then it was a uh, negative... Thing. It was a negative thing, you know. Uh, especially in the 60s. Uh, I, I remember the Doors... I do. I remember and, and that Morrison too. Morrison just yeah. refused to do that. Right. Have yeah. their song in a car commercial or something. Right. <laughs> Now, now you're watching a Mercedes drive down the road while you're watching TV, and it's like Aerosmith playing. And what's funny is it will be like a song they released like two months ago. Yeah, it won't even be an old the song. Video. <laughs> Steven Tyler's driving. <laughs> right. So how did you guys meet Lauren Black? How does he come into the picture? Uh, we just went and stole him out of a band. It's like we just went around looking at bands, and we go, oh, that guy looks good. It looks like he knows what he's doing. He's playing real good. And, uh, you know, he was kind of a bass fan, which I always like bass players that are really bass players. Um, you know, you sit there and, and quiz them, you know, like, who is the bass? What's the bass player's name for Jefferson Airplane? <laughs> If they could come with it, you know, this guy's a bass fan. He, he's cool, you know. I always thought he was an awesome bass player. I was... Uh... Yeah, actually, great baseball. you know he played on once bitten. I know that. I was very sad to uh, see him go, actually. But um, yeah, I know. Uh, and Jack had told me the story where he didn't show up or showed up really late to that video, which I just thought four hours. I already warned him a million times because uh, you know that's the whole thing about the drinking. You know, I'm a full blown alcoholic, anyways. But but I always showed up. You know, uh, you know he was uh, it was affecting his responsibilities. You know, and affecting the whole band in the sense he wasn't showing up to something like a rock me video. <laughs> you know, that's when you know that's when, that's getting serious. But a uh, wonderful uh, bass player. What did you use on that self-titled album? Did you record with the uh, BC Rich guitar? Yeah, I used the BC Rich on the first album. I think the whole record I used the BC Rich. Do you still have that guitar? I gave it to my son. Oh wow! I had one. I I had a two or three of them but i gave that main one to my son oh wow he put he plays guitar too did you modify that one at all no i didn't do anything to it you know uh bernie from uh, bc rich uh just gave me one i played through it i think vivian campbell was playing him at the time too oh no he wasn't he wasn't they wanted to get vivian campbell but actually that's how i met buddy blaze and got into Kramer's. Buddy Blaze from Texas, right? Yeah, yeah, he's a great guitar maker. He made all my Kramer's back then. Oh, wow, and I didn't know that. when he left the company, they really went down on their uh, quality. So I started playing like Fenders again and stuff. That's what I usually do if the company starts failing me. I. I I'd go and grab a Fender or something. You know, the famous Dimebag Daryl guitar that Buddy Blaze had done yeah. that guitar and then yeah. took it and either sold it to him because Daryl wanted a, a Camaro, you know, and uh, and so and then later Buddy Blaze gave it back to him after he, you know, painted it and did all that to it. But um, you no, know, Buddy used to drive those guys around in bands or something. They were more like a Bon Jovi type band at the beginning. Well, uh, people will say that, but they were definitely more. I mean, their their second record was really heavy. I mean, really, most of no, them. I were mean, before their first record, I'm talking about way early days before they recorded anything. Well, sure, but in 1983, they released that first album. They were just little kids, but but they weren't. They yeah. were definitely a heavy, probably more in the vein of like. Um, Iron Maiden or or that Shout at the Devil era Motley Crue, you know, they they maybe weren't. Maybe it was more of their uh, maybe it was more of their closing. Yeah, they they definitely went glam kind of a little later, but uh, but some of those albums are actually really really good, uh, you know, compared to even what yeah, was I know, coming uh, out. Dimebag or whatever is a really good. He was a really good guitar player, and I've met him a few times in Dallas, and he was always really sweet to me. And just a great player, you know. Oh, I remember being at a at oh. a show, and and they played. Uh, you know, they were they do a lot of covers, even though they had two records out at the time. And I still remember them playing "Stick It," you know, because that was popular at the time. Uh, when we were on tour with Jesus Priest, we used to we used to play clubs on the days off. You know, and we were playing five shows a week, but on our days off, we'd go play a club. And this one time, we went. Uh, we were in Sacramento and we played a club and the opening band 
we were playing like you know docking covers and you know all, all kinds of cover songs pretty much a cover band and and it was actually uh they were called city kid and they became tesla and it, we ended up uh, three or four years later doing a full tour with them pretty amazing that we met them when they were a cover band and then all of a sudden you know they had this killer record that, that was really neat yeah you guys did like a co-headlining thing with them right correct yeah and we had jakey lee opening band called badland so that was a really awesome tour are you a fan of jakey lee's playing oh yeah and he's a good friend of mine uh you know we always got we got along really good on that tour and uh he's, he's a sweet guy we even did a couple of magazine covers or at least one i think i think we did one thing where we were together you know we did a cover for a guitar for the practicing musician. He was awesome. He played so loud, dude. On his side of the stage, the singer, uh, Ray Gillen or whatever. Uh, of course. He told me he wouldn't even go on his side of the stage because it was so loud. He, he had like all these cabinets going and everything and he played like just ridiculous. And uh, he told me one day Ray was on the stage and we were sound checking and he goes, I could sleep by your amp. <laughs> go to sleep in comparison to Jake. And you know, he played with Rat in the beginning. Well, they were called Mickey Rat, I think. Right. Yeah, and Rough Cut. Yeah. He was in Rough Cut for a brief moment yeah. as well. I he... saw him on the Monsters Cruise and we took another picture together. It was pretty funny. We, t we tried to do the same pose, all old and stuff. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's I think how he it, still had long hair too. Was you want to hear another a kind of ironic story and sure. kind of crazy? Sure. Is, I was telling you earlier, George Lynch called me and said he was sent for my bass player and, uh, you know, to audition for Ozzy. The way I understood it, I thought George had that gig locked down. But what happened was when they saw Costa and his long, hideous black hair and his image and everything, he pretty much got the gig instantly. Uh -huh. Well, Jake was auditioning too. When they saw those two guys together, they said, that's the band. Because Lynch had cut his hair pretty short. And... You know, he had it dyed. It was almost like the skunk dude. You right. Know what I mean? Right. Yeah, so I it remember was that. Almost like, almost new age looking. Right. You know? Yeah, like that and, guy uh, from Kaja Gugu. Really, those are my favorite Ozzy releases. Bark at the Moon and Bark at the Moon, Ultimate yeah. Sin. Or uh, I love the Jake era better. I know everybody's like, oh, it's Randy Rhodes, and I get it. I like Randy Rhodes too, but. I, oh, yeah. Jake was my favorite uh, era in the band. I just saw the, even the other day I was watching something where he talked about how Don got fired and it was like at the Us Festival. Um, yeah. You saw that where he like Ozzy headbutted him or something. Well, I've, known that, I've known that story. Everything but the headbutt, I've, I've known that story forever. Oh, okay. The only thing different about the story I heard was that he walked up to a helicopter to fly over a fence and they told him he was out of the band. Right. That's the first time I heard that he went to the bus and they told him. But I knew that they um, got Daisley the night before and everything. And, right. And Daisley was going to do the gig. But what I didn't know, uh, and I knew they told Costa at the last minute, but um, what I heard was that Costa was upstaging Ozzy while he was singing. Like, in other words, he was in front of him. Right. And, and Sharon called him into an office and said, not me at all. Just sit, asked him to, you know, be behind Ozzy when he's uh, singing. You know, you can go ahead and go up front or whatever when he's not singing and you're jamming or whatever. But when he sings, don't go walk in front of him. And what I heard was a few gigs later, he told the crew guy that he goes, I still do it, but I do it when they're not looking. That crew guy went straight to Sharon and told her. And so that's that's the reason I heard for the for the very rude uh, firing. That makes sense to me now when I heard about Ozzy headbutting him because Sharon probably told Ozzy that, that he said that. I, I don't think they just out of the blue, blue just got all cruel and just fired him for no reason, you know. Was he doing the cheese grater stuff on the knuckles with, with you guys? No, okay. No. Don is a true bass player to his core. He just took everything to the extreme when he was in our band. He used to just play bass. He was a big Getty Lee fan. He really knew how to play. I mean, this guy studied bass players like nobody's business, and he could really, really play played with his fingers. He was a monster bass player. I told him, I go, 
you know, because he was so reserved. He would just stand there and he didn't move a muscle. And I go, dude, can you move around more? Because it looks like you, you hate what you're doing or something. And he just took it to levels that just were way beyond what I was asking. <laughs> Before I knew it, this guy had like the Queen Mary anchors wrapped around him. He had cheese graters and he just went basket weaver. And, and he kind of quit. Well, he still played his bass, but he, he went all crazy. He was doing like solos with a pickaxe and bleeding all over the place. He got hepatitis like twice. So he he went absolutely bonkers. Had had he been in the band when Niven came down, he wouldn't he would have refused to go see us again. It it, it was bad. But um, but the guy when he played bass, I mean, he could really play. I'm serious. He, he was awesome. He didn't really do anything after Ozzy, did he? Uh, he actually just totally disappeared. But I can tell you this: when he was in our band, he was he was kind of a kind of like a business leader. You know, he got all our gigs. Um, he really worked hard uh, to get the band, you know, as far as it could go. So he was real good with the business end and a uh, super great guy. But you still have such a great uh, guitar sound. What's the secret on your guitar sound? You know, believe it or not, a lot of it is just the hands. Because, I, I mean, I, I get asked all the time from, you know, up and comers or this guitar player and that guitar player, they want to know the exact pedals I use right. and this, that, and the other. But I plugged in, no matter what amp I've ever plugged in, it always sounds the same to me. It, it's, uh, it has a lot to do with your hands and the way you play because I remember I played on Glenn Hughes's, uh, I think it was his first solo album. And I didn't have an amp and I just said, is that amp working over there? It was like a... <laughs> an Ampeg combo amp. And they go, yeah, it works. And I go, let's put a mic on it. Let me hear see what it sounds like. And I go, okay, that sounds pretty good. Let's, you know, roll tape or whatever. And I was done like in 20 minutes. It sounded just like everything else I've ever done. Wow. You know? So I don't think there's any magic. Obviously, you know, beautiful, sweet tube sounds and all that are, are pretty cool. I've been using a Kemper. I, I used the Kemper on the last album. Obviously, I've profiled a lot of great amps, but um, that's what I used on the last album. I, uh, Michael Wagner talked me into it just to listen to it. I really wasn't into it at first, and then he goes, well, why don't you just try it? And the very first program, I guess it was a Marshall head through, through Greenback, you know, 25-watt speakers or whatever, and I played three chords, and I'm going... I sound like Angus Young. What else you got in that thing? <laughs> you know, I, I go, man, this is cool. I can't believe this is, you know, because I'm thinking like, when he first told me about the Kemper, I'm going, what is it, like Amp Farm? I go, I like to plug into amps and have the speakers blazing. And he goes, well, just try it, you know, and I, and I tried it. I was like blown away. I could believe it. And what kind of guitar do you use in the studio? Um, I use several guitars. Uh, I remember I used a, a Steinberger on a couple of parts. I used a, a 52 Fender Telecaster. I used my RH Custom, which was built by this uh, local guitar maker. It's kind of like a Strat meets uh, Tele, you know, somewhere in between Strat and Tele. And uh, what else did I use? Les Paul and something. So I use three or four guitars. I have another guitar that was built by a guy called Michael Reisinger. Um, from, uh, it was Ed Roman, who's from Las Vegas. He died a, f a few years ago, but uh, he, built, he built this guitar for me uh, called a Quicksilver that it looks like kind of like a Paul Reed Smith that sounds nothing. I couldn't play a Paul Reed Smith in Great White. Uh, they, they sound too, I need a more jangly musical sound. I can't do the, I mean, it's great for like Carl Santana and stuff, sure. but just the way our music is, um, it, it's too processed sounding coming from the guitar. So I can't really play them, but, uh, it looked like it. It was kind of mind blowing. It kind of looks like it, but really nice wood and everything. So that that sounded pretty good. And I had uh, TV Jones Powertron pickups in it. 
which in the bridge position it's a uh, eight point five k, and so it's a lower output pickup. So it's not like overly distorted coming from the guitar. If if anything, that's more of a secret to my sound than anything really amp related. Is you know, I always tell you know, uh, younger guitar players that ask me about my sound, I say, well, I went low on the output of the pickup because I didn't want distortion coming from my guitar. Because my point being, I want the notes to be as loud as possible because I can always get distortion from anywhere. I just don't like it when the distortion, and also I don't want to lose my sound, you know, um, I want the notes to speak really well, but I want to be able to have the distortion too. So you can hear what the heck I'm doing. Sometimes the distortion is louder than the notes. So there's no distinction, you know, but obviously I don't want to, you know, for my kind of music, I can't, you know, play straight through a twin reverb or anything. Although I've done records before where I had like 15 combo amps and just use like pedals and stuff. (laughs) 